Welcome to our Spring Women's Leadership Forum titled Advancing Women Through Developmental Relationships, a Dialogue with Global Experts. I'm Dr. Susan Madsen, Founding Director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, and I'm also the Karen Haid Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University, and I'm the host and will be the panel moderator today. And this event furthers the mission of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, which is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. And we serve Utah and its residents by first producing relevant, trustworthy, and applicable research, second, creating and gathering valuable resources, and then finally, to convene trainings and events like this that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Utah Education Network, UEN, the John M. Huntsman School of Business, and USU Extension for making this event possible. So I'd like to introduce our, my two guests and friends. Uh, first, Dr. Wendy M. Murphy is an Associate Dean and Professor of Management at Babson College. Her research is at the intersection of careers, developmental mentoring networks, and diversity issues. And she publishes in journals uh, such as resource, uh, Human Resource Management, Gender and Management, Journal of Management, and the Journal of Vocational Behaviors, among others. And she also co-edited the Handbook of Research Methods and Careers. And her book with Kathy, uh, Strategic Relationships at Work, Bridges, Mentoring, Scholarship, and Practice, um, is also one that I've read. And she has also written for Harvard Business Review, MIT Sloan Management Review, and Boston Business Journal. Welcome to you, Wendy. It's good to have you here. Thank you, Susan. Dr. Kathy E. Cram is the R.C. Shipley Professor of Management uh, Emerita at Boston University. And her research interests are in the areas of adult development, relational learning, mentoring and developmental networks, gender and leadership development, and change processes in organizations. And in, her, in addition to her book, Mentoring at Work, she has co-authored Strategic Relationships at Work, Creating Your Circle of Mentors, Sponsors, and Peers for Success in Business and Life. And she's co-authored Peer Coaching at Work, and also co-edited the Handbook of Mentoring at Work, theory, practice, and research. And in addition, she has published in many academic and practitioner journals, and she's also a founding member of the Center for Research on Emotional Intelligence and Organizations, and has also served as a member of the Center for Creative Leadership Board of Governors. So I'm excited to have you here as well, Kathy. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. And to those listening in, Go ahead and put your questions either in the Q&A or the chat. I check both of them. And we'll actually, it's a panel discussion, so we'll check them from time to time. And Wendy and Kathy, you're welcome to check them as well. And we can jump in with answers, uh, your answers or responses as you would like. But we'll definitely leave some time at the end for, for questions as well. So I um, want to give just a little more background on these two because um, I have submitted a new edited book that I am the editor for. It's a second edition of one that we've done already, um, and it's called The Handbook of Research on Gender and Leadership. And Wendy and Kathy have been, and another co-author, have um, written in the first version that was published in 2017, and then also this next uh, edition that will come out next year, ho hopefully later this year, maybe early next year. So this is actually based on my questions are based on a chapter that they wrote and uh, we've submitted to that book. But they also, as you can tell, are both experts in this topic, have written numerous books and so forth. So I look forward to this conversation. So I want to start, um, and Wendy, I'll start with you. Just why is each of you so interested, and I would say passionate about, because I feel your passion in your words, the topic of developmental relationships, and particularly for women? 
Well, so for me, interestingly, Kathy plays a big role in that, actually. Um, when I was in graduate school and prior to in my work experience, I was very observational and phenomenological in my interests. Um, and I noticed patterns in the workplace. I was in retail and it was predominantly men in the upper echelons and we had a woman CEO. And when she told her story, it was she leaped ahead because um, the woman ahead of her had maternity leave and actually had twins. Um, and that story always kind of bothered me. <laughs> um, and so when I got into graduate school and started studying you know, relationships and, work and workplace issues, I was looking for how do we improve the workplace? How do we create opportunity? Um, and I explored this, this literature on mentoring. And I was fortunate in that I was an institution where you were allowed to have outside members of your dissertation committee. And so oh. I took a class at a different institution and was introduced to Kathy at BU um, and pulled her in. <laughs> Very Not are you. Not are you, um, taught you though. Uh, yeah, a different you, right? Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so it, it that relationship and the network that I started to form really did influence how I, I put my dissertation together, which was about um, women aspirations based on their developmental networks. So it, it became, it was very early for me and has just grown as I've observed more and more issues over the past few years and kind of pushed into leadership and diversity as a whole as areas of interest. I love that background because, you know, it is interesting how when cro paths cross yeah. and, you're, and you just have ahas from teachers or colleagues or whatever, it can change the trajectory of what you're thinking about yeah. doing and spending your time. So I'd yeah. so love to have Kathy answer that same question well i have kind of a similar answer because um <clears throat> for me my interest started on my first job out of college which i came of age in 1972 which if you recall was the beginning of the equal employment opportunity commission and affirmative action laws and i went to work for an insurance company and there were very, very few women around me. I felt very isolated. And it was uh, one woman who was in charge of EEO for the company that reached out to me. And if it weren't for her, I don't know if I would have stayed with the job because I did didn't have people that were guiding me and coaching me. And I, I knew there was something about that relationship that was essential. And then when I went to graduate school, I was exposed to Dan Levinson's work, Seasons of a Man's Life, in which he has these four pages about how essential mentorship is to young men in their adult, young adult lives. And I thought, that's it. That's what I experienced. I hadn't labeled it as such. Mm -hmm. And why, you know, what is the case for women, given that there are so few of us? And over the course of my career, um, Wendy acknowledges my role in her development, but she also played an important role in my development. And so I learned about the reciprocity of developmental relationships, that it, it enhanced me to have a young woman who I could guide and share my experiences with. And we could both learn from that dialogue. And that's exactly uh, what happened. And I've been passionate ever since. I'm now involved in a study of retirement and you know what? People entering retirement need developers as well to figure oh. out that road to a new life stage. Yeah. I love that. And research when when our life experiences, I mean, when people say, what are you most interested in? Oftentimes it's related to our experiences and where we're at in life. So I love that new right. project you're, you're working on, Kathy, because there's a lot of people moving into retirement that want that continued purpose and, and calling feel in life. So, um, so what are some of the challenges that women face? And I'm going to start broader and then we'll work to the developmental relationships. But what are some of the challenges that women face 
specifically in leadership development and growth. Um, Wendy, I'll go back to you on this one and, um, and then I'll switch the order for the next question. Totally fine. Um, so when we look at the broad research, the literature tells us and our experience tells us um, that the issues are twofold. They're both structural and perceptual. So for women in, in particular, we've done a lot of research, and this isn't just me and Kathy, but a huge field of research body of work talks about um, women's exclusion from informal networks. Um, and informal networks are really um, developed based on identification. And so we tend to seek out those relationships with people who are similar to us. And not romantically, but we, but we seek people who are like us. Um, and that means that we end up having a, in our informal networks, just naturally, women have fewer sponsors, people willing to advocate for you, people who are in the senior echelons of the organization, and fewer role models where we can see ourselves in someone else. Um, our career paths tend to be gendered as well. Um, when you look at how the workplace is organized structurally, a lot of programs really favor a very traditional family structure where they assume, for example, rotational leadership roles where you have to move in different parts of the country or even internationally, all assume a trailing spouse. Or all of our careers that are up or out, um, academia, law, accounting, much of consulting, most of those up or out jobs are within the first 10 to 15 years of your career. And those are all the times when women would be having children are at their most fertile. So those are, those are some structural underpinnings of how we organize and how we think about work. And then the perceptual barriers, you know, we talk about se second generation gender bias where it's not quite as obvious as it might've been discriminatory in the past. However, that still exists. Um, but things like the double bind dilemma, um, where women can be warm or seen as comp warm, fulfilling their traditional feminine role or competent, which you need to be a leader, but it's hard to do both as a woman. You can't fulfill both stereotypes simultaneously. Um, or, or cultural assumptions and biases that, that simply exist. And, and there's a huge literature on diversity that supports this. Our patterns of in, informal interactions, um, people are, you know, men might be hesitant, um, have less interpersonal comfort in relationships with women, generate less rapport, and therefore they don't support them in the same way. Um, and met, so much of this is unintentional and culturally underpins the way the workplace happens, but it's there nevertheless. And some of the literature, oftentimes we call it implicit bias or unconscious right. bias, but, but the second generation gender bias is another term that our academic literature is using. That's right. Yeah, and Kathy, any additional thoughts on some of yeah. the challenges that women face in well, that growth I, and development? I think if you take all of the challenges that Wendy just enumerated, they explain why women tend not to vision a role as a leader. So if you ask women what they see in their future, they're not likely, at least in my generation, probably still to some extent in Wendy's generation, maybe not so much with young women today, because there are more women in leadership roles who they can identify with. But the absence of female role models and leadership roles for so many years made it almost impossible for women to have a sense of myself as a leader. And this is why the idea of developmental network developed um, in the early 2000s, because my colleague Monica Higgins and I recognized that it's really limiting for women to seek only one mentor who more than likely will be a male in most male dominated organizations and not to learn and identify with other people who are both men and women and of different ethnicities and different cultural backgrounds to really benefit from having multiple role models. Um, 
And that's one of the basic reasons we expanded the idea of mentoring to consider the developmental network, which is simply those set of relationships that most support you as an individual with aspirations to advance. Yeah, thank you so much. Let's move into, I'm gonna save one of my questions for a little bit, but let's move into, since you brought that up, you know, we, a lot of people don't know that term developmental relationships. And then you also have used the term developmental networks. Yeah. But but I, I use that all the time because a relationship is different than a developmental relationship. Uh, yes. Experience is different than, an, than a developmental experience. So Kathy, let's start with you. I mean, talk to us about the different kinds of developmental relationships. Let's start there. Yeah. Yeah, first. Okay, so it, there's a very easy definition of a developmental relationship. It's a relationship whose purpose is to provide learning and growth to one or both parties to the relationship. So there's some acknowledgement about prioritizing learning and growth. Um, more recently, there's even been research to suggest that when both people, both mentor and protege are learning, that the relationship is even higher quality than when just the younger person is learning. And then Wendy and I and Carrie Gibson in this article chapter we did for your book identified five different types of relationships. Is that what you're asking about? Yes, yes, yes exactly. So, so we have mentors, which are the traditional all-encompassing coach, guide, teacher, role model. We have sponsors who are senior people with the power to promote um, and to make create visibility for up-and-coming talented people. We have peers. We have executive coaches that can be hired to provide certain kinds of developmental functions. And we have learning partners, which might include spouses, family members, community members, who also can be developers. So when we talk about a developmental network, Susan, we're really talking about that uh, handful or more relationships that an individual uh, enlists into their own developmental agenda. And that's truly what Wendy did when she and I first met was to invite me into her development. And that's often how networks evolve. It's through you as the focal person identifying people who could be helpful to you and reaching out to them. I love that because what you're saying in terms of the developmental network is that we don't just have like one role model, that we could have many, but we could have an, a mentor, but but a sponsor is different than a mentor. And a learning partner could look different, you know, and, and a peer could, you know, there's different kinds. And you're saying like, you know, and, and when I teach women's leadership programming, I actually have them chart out, like, think about your relationships and what kind of relationships do you have? Wendy, what, what else would you like to add? Um, I think some of the context is also helpful in terms of where these ideas come from, which is that organizations are less reliable than our relationships. So um, a lot of these ideas started burgeoning when there were a lot of mergers and acquisitions and people started leaving organizations, having boundaryless mm -hmm. careers, moving across organizations to build their career instead of staying in one place. And what we know is that while your tie to an organization might, be, might not be stable, might not be forever, um, your relationships can yeah. be stable and can create both opportunities um, and further your development because people outside of your organization have access to information and resources that those inside may not, particularly oh. for women. So those external relationships are very important. We, when you talk about mapping, Susan, uh, we're very, very careful to ensure that people think 
holistically about their personal board of advisors or developmental network um, and think about the various social arenas in which they engage and that they can have these learning conversations because it can happen at the workplace as well as in other workplace with former colleagues or potential future colleagues, right? In volunteer organizations, in your neighborhood, with your family, we get different resources. So they're not all giving us a strategy, particularly the next skill to advance, but they're giving us psychosocial support or they're serving as a objective sounding boards for us when we're thinking, is, is this normal? Does, does this happen? Is this a culture in other places? Um, and, and those are really important. And oftentimes we really just focus on our workplace relationships. When we're thinking about our professional development, oftentimes I found this with developmental experiences too, because you can serve on a United Way board. I've done that and different things that you could get major learning from right. those. And in my own work, I found that motherhood, actually I have a whole section in, in a couple of my books on motherhood and and your, your partner or other, I mean, all of that can actually help you in not non-work life, but also in work. That's right. Yeah. No, that's so true, Susan. I noticed in my last few years of teaching that the MBA students, if I invited them to draw their developmental networks, almost invariably, they would emphasize the senior managers that they identified as mentors, they would minimize the importance of peers. Mm. And they wouldn't even remember that spouse at home <laughs> who they come home to every night and uh, unload to, you know. So it takes some real awareness of what the research suggests to open your eyes to all the possible relationships that one can benefit from. Yeah. yeah. And the more that we're aware, that's why I like the activities that I've done in the past is it, it all of a sudden brings to your awareness that maybe I'm learning from these things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Wendy, can you just share a little more about, uh, Kathy had mentioned the term learning partner. Give us a little bit more about what that, I think a lot of us know the mentor, and the sponsor and the executive coach, which typically is outside, but I but I know sometimes organizations have those inside. Um, but what's that learning partner? You know, I think that's that speaks directly to relationships outside of the workplace, okay. those informal relationships, um, because you don't necessarily have a label for them, right? It's um, they're oftentimes peer relationships, um, but we don't. They're not necessarily like colleagues at work. Um, when I was, gosh, back when I was doing my dissertation work, almost everyone I spoke with included a spouse, partner, or family member in their developmental network, and they can be very helpful learning partners. Mm -hmm. um, when you have those conversations about your career, you're certainly learning in dialogue with someone else. And so it's, it's kind of a catch-all phrase that helps us find a place to have that discussion of those important relationships within right. a personal board of advisors. I was just smiling because I was just thinking about a conversation I had with my husband this morning because, and we've been married for a lot of years. And um, so sometimes he's learned, let me just say it. He's learned, you know, the, the nail in the head, what was that called the video of, of you just listen sometimes, but um, sometimes he just listens but I learn a lot from it because I talk through things. And so would you call him, even if he doesn't say anything sometimes, a learning partner? Absolutely, I would. Yeah. Well, and what, the research, what we know about learning from your experience yeah. is you don't actually learn and capture that unless you reflect on it. And yeah. so what you're doing in that, Susan, is you're reflecting in dialogue. And that's actually a critically important role that our developers play. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for that background. Um, I'm going to jump back to a question I was going to ask right before this, but, and then, then we'll, we'll continue. But in, in your writing, especially in the chapter you just wrote, you say that the accumulation of both human capital and social capital are necessary for leadership development. Just, just tell us what you mean by that. 
um, let's let's go to Kathy on that one. Sure. So human capital refers to all the talents and skills and knowledge that we carry within us. And we can continue to learn for a lifetime and build greater human capital in a number of ways. Uh, social capital are the resources made available to us through relationships. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you've thought about, um, you know, there when you have a, an issue or a problem, people may come to mind. He'd be a good person to talk to, mm -hmm. or perhaps he knows someone I could contact regarding something else. Those are examples of social capital. Wow. So it's not you know, it's not enough to be smart and to have more talent than anybody else in the organization. You also need the social capital to help you open doors and to solve problems and uh, to get the opportunities that you seek. Thank you so much. I did, something else came to mind real quick. We call executive coaches, but sometimes a lot of people use the word like, this person, and a lot of people do to me, is you're my mentor. But I, I know the literature and I'm like, I'm really not a, your mentor in term, but I would say I coach occasionally. You know, I'll, I'll do like a even five minutes, 15 minutes chatting with somebody, giving those, those small, you know, moments that I've had people do to me that get me thinking, oh my gosh, in a different direction. So would you put that kind of relationship in your five categories someplace? Definitely. I mean, I, we, you know, I think we could say what you just described embodies a learning partner or an executive coach or a peer coach, right? Could yeah. be any of those. And they can be short-term interactions, which is what our colleagues Jane Dutton and others and Bell Reagan's talk about their their momentary interactions yeah. that can have a big impact. And that's a coaching event, really. It yeah. may not be a long-term developmental relationship, but it is. But they can be critical. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Wendy, anything else that you, I, I kind of, you know, I mentioned the importance of that word developmental yeah. already, and we talked about that, but any anything else you would like to add on why that developmental piece is so important when we use these phrases? Uh, so the key, the key to developmental is learning. Um, but what you were just mentioning, those moments, we can build on those moments. And so um, I think what Kathy was referring to is research on high quality connections. Mm -hmm. And they have three characteristics that they start with that some positive regard, right? Assuming the best of, a, of other people, that you're mutually engaged in the moment together, right? You're both fully present um, and that you leave that interaction with a heightened sense of vitality or energy, which mm -hmm. is exactly what you were describing, Susan. And they're really important because they start, they're, they're the building blocks of learning relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And when you build those relationships that are that are very much developmental, um, you get those benefits of high quality connection where your cognitive capacity is improved, is increased. We literally build new neural pathways through relationships. And that's why developmentally, like child development is so important to have strong uh, adult relationships in our in our history. Um, we literally absorb knowledge more quickly because of those increased connections. Right. Thus, we can experiment and grow as leaders and try new things, which you need to do to grow as a leader, right? And all of these positive benefits, we're more engaged, we're more open, we're more resilient. Um, all of these happen when we have those characteristics in the relationship. I love those three. That's, that's great to help us think more about um, these relationships. So let's shift now and really start talking. I know you two love this. I do as well. I am so intrigued with studying identity and especially leadership identity. And as we know, um, you know, even today, the research tells us that boys 
see themselves more often than girls as future leaders because of socialization, because of, you know, we don't even see, you know, you can't be what you can't see and all of those things. But talk specifically, I mean, you've, you've talked about how relationships are tied to internalizing specifically for women that leadership identity. So yeah, just just give it give me a little bit more on that. Kathy, do you want to start on that one? Sure. Um, I think one's leadership identity is what I'll use myself, what I see in myself that could enact leadership for whatever constituency I might be interested in. And the way I develop that vision of myself is by seeing it in other people who I can identify with. So when I first started my work career, I didn't see any women other than this one woman who found me in this lonely insurance company. But most of the leaders I saw around me were men. Um, and so it wasn't easy for me to imagine myself in a leadership role. Because but gender look, is so important. I mean, so gender important. for women is, uh, for, and for men, right? Yeah, yeah. The other thing is, as Wendy mentioned earlier, was, you know, the traditional male model of leadership usually has a supportive wife at home managing the family. And now, you know, women are leaders and their mothers, and um, there are shared responsibilities for the family. So the leader identity and the mother identity can be integrated now. There are ways that women have found to be able to do that. And that's a big shift in our cultural context. Um, but I would say generally that it's through relationships where we are affirmed by other people that we are exhibiting certain leadership qualities. I mean, I can remember the first time a mentor of mine said to me, this was right after I got my PhD, he looked at me and says, you're gonna turn your dissertation into a book, aren't you? And that was the furthest thing from my mind until he mm -hmm. said it. And then I knew um, that, oh, I'm sorry. Then I knew um, that it was possible because he expressed confidence in me. So it's little things like that where another person affirms a tentative idea you might have about your own capability and that enables it to blossom. Mm. I love that. Yeah. That is so key. You know, in my career, I've seen that too. I mean, the, just a lot of times, even when people use those words, um, and, and I've looked at some of that research, even in, in the home, when when the mother, let's say, is referred to by the, by the partner or spouse as a leader, oh, she's leading in the community, or she's doing, just even using those words can help change change yes. our perceptions a little bit. Mm. So Wendy, any other thoughts on that? I, I mean, I think why this, the reason this idea of identity resonates so clearly with us in the, in the women's literature um, is because identity, identity construction is fundamentally social. Um, so we oh. define ourselves in relation to others and the role of leadership only exists in relation to others. Yeah. And so what Kathy was talking about, about get, having affirmation and checking, right, that you're behaving as a leader, those checks and balances, we, we, in transitioning to leadership and trying new things, we try on different hats, and Herminia Iberia, Iberia calls this provisional selves, and you need that feedback in order to test that those provisional selves are, are working, and so it's, it's not really fake it till you make it, it's fake it till you are it, um, mm -hmm. and leadership in particular because it doesn't happen on its own, it happens in relation to others, is it's really important that you have support for that identity pathway. Yeah, and, the, and, and we know from the research um, that girls and women 
are more relational than boys and men generally. So our identity is so keyed into what other people, and for good or bad, right? What other people think of us, how we think other people see us, which some of the research tells us that women, we don't, we're not great at that sometimes. We assume some people see us less than what we right. see ourselves, right? Yeah. And a lot of that is where that imposter syndrome comes from too, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we have, we just finished a couple months ago, based on research, a four hour online course, um, pretty deep on uh, the imposter syndrome or phenomenon, you know, the literature uses some different things like that. Before we shift, I'm going to ask you a question, not on my list, (laughs) but thinking about identity, it's something that I think about often. How do we strengthen that leadership identity in girls and young women, teens and and girls. Have you have you spoken about that, written about that? I mean, what are some tips? Obviously, one of them is them seeing more women as leaders, right? But any other things, if if there are people on that have daughters, like how do we we can tell them a lot to your leader and that would help, but any other more subtle or blunt? Yeah. Of things. I happen to have two teenage daughters. Oh, do you? <laughs> um, and I would say, you know, they're they're facing a more challenging environment in terms of mental health. We all know that, right? Um, but surprisingly, having um, they have a majority. So in our educational systems, for good and for bad, a majority of their teachers are women. Um, and so actually, it turns out they have role models in that career path, but not necessarily outside of that career path. Um, and so we know about the, the gendered gendered career paths in and of themselves. Um, so I think it's really important to get them exposure to women who do other things, um, whether that's you know through career days or through volunteering in the community or you know your own networks, giving them exposure to different professions awesome. that that exist. Speaking of which. <laughs> <laughs> calling right now. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to take this. I'm so sorry. Okay, Kathy. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I will um, pick up on that. I wonder about <clears throat> participation in sports. I think that's mm-hmm. made a real difference for girls um, because it's on the sports field that you learn collaboration, you learn resilience. Um, you learn to empower others, you learn to encourage others, and this is all, these are all elements of leadership. Yeah. Um, and I think you, you learn to appreciate your body for what it does, what it can do, not as an object of what people see in you, which is the body image as we know, and, and, and there's not as much newer research on this, but the, especially the impact on leadership aspirations and identity of social media and different yeah. things, but I, it's it's got to have taken a hit in a lot of ways. So, um, but I love the sports. I was a sports person. I coached for twenty years, and you do learn a lot of things. You learn resilience. You learn how to how to lose. You learn how to go exactly. on. Um, I also, in my research, found that speech and debate in high school kind of gave you some of those things. And by the way, those of you listening in, I I am a big, I have six brothers and was a big sports person. Even if if your daughter is not super athletic and coordinated, especially at those young ages, you know, there's running, there's there's team sports, even at younger that that would be helpful um, in so many ways. Wendy. <laughs> so I have to apologize. And I think it was a great demonstration <laughs> of what happens when, when women have children and in our sandwich. So my daughter, she forgot her cleats. I have an athlete and <laughs> she has a game after school. And so right at three o'clock when we're done, I'll be able to run t- those to her, but she called me and not her father. And by the way, her father has an extraordinary flexibility <laughs> and is, I only works part-time. Oh. Um, and yet I get the phone call. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is part of the dilemma of leadership is 
the way our, our expectations are around who does what and even the children you know they've they've grown up in a household with me I'm in leadership roles and yet they still call mom yeah that that's a very you know uh much of a habit I think and and it is interesting always to look at the the dynamics and how things happen um, Can I, so build on, uh, I want to build on Wendy's example because um it demonstrates the need for women to have both male and female developers, because mm. there is not a male developer who can really empathize and appreciate what Wendy's experiencing, but other women can. Yeah, they definitely um, get it. Right? I, know, I know a few stay-at-home dads that are really engaged okay. and got there, but but I'm not sure too many. Do. And also, they're not mistaken for the the caretaker the way That's right. Wendy True. is persistently, even though she's held leadership roles for years. You know, so I'm making the case for what our colleague David Thomas refers to as dual support that mm -hmm. we consciously enlist <clears throat> both male and female dilemma uh, developers because. Yeah they offer us different kinds of support. And I do think that's that's really important not to just have women um, as as our sponsors or whatever, to have the mix. I think that's that's great. Yeah. I do want to, oh, yeah. Wendy, did you have any, anything? Oh, no, okay. No, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just gonna open up to a question um, that was asked in the Q&A. How can women leverage? So we've talked about those developmental relationships. Now, how can women leverage their existing relationships? Um, first of all, uh, another question just came to my mind to be developmental and then to open up new opportunities or advance their careers in specific industries or fields. Wendy, I'll have you start and take that one. Sure. I, I mean, I think the first thing is at, as, protégés, mentees, you know, and we are that our whole lives, by the way, um, that we are able to identify kind of what help we need, but make it broad enough that people can contribute. And so when you're activating those relationships that you know, go to them and say, you know, I'm, I'm interested in learning more about X, Y, and Z. Could you help me? Or do you know anyone or have any resources? Could you point me in the right direction? very often they'll know something themselves, but they'll also know somebody to connect you. And so those weak ties that are one network person away from you are really important in, in starting to develop learning capabilities. Um, but that reflection, that, that time you spend thinking specifically, what do I need to learn? What project am I working on next? This happens very naturally in any career transition. You know, what am I looking for next? Um, that's a that's a great reason to call someone. The other thing that's a great excuse to call someone is taking a webinar or a seminar or a class and saying, I was learning about X from Susan's seminar and I just thought I'd reach out and see if we could have a conversation, see if we can have coffee um, and talk more about what you know or, or I could learn more from you and really set up, frame that conversation as a learning conversation. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Anything else to add, Kathy, to that? Or did she? No, I totally support what Wendy just said. And I often ask, oh, I did when I was teaching students to generate some topics and questions that they can bring with them to meetings they might have with their manager or their manager's manager. You know, when they're going to meet up with people they don't know very well. How could you invite more depth in the conversation? Not only can you ask questions, but you can also share more of yourself and what it is you're learning or what it is you want to learn. Um, One of the things that I really uh, appreciated um, about your comments, though, and it have made me think about what I appreciate when people reach out to me um, is when they've done their homework. When they're not coming to me and just saying, tell me about the Utah Women in Leadership Project. And I'm like, oh, 
you know, because my day starts at three and I'm kind of packed. It's like, go to the website. You can get a lot more at the right. website and just do that. And then ask me very targeted questions. So I think I'm not the only one. I think all of us really appreciate people that have done their work, right? And and come with with questions that help help. Um, and I really appreciate questions that are not too broad, like like just tell me about your whole life or something. <laughs> you know, like what specific thing you know in that conversation after I speak or whatever that I can give them a little tip. Um, so th th those are a couple of things, Wendy. Well, and how different is it, Susan, when someone reaches out and says, I was reading about the Utah project and um, really admire X that you've done. Like, how good does that feel? It's a real compliment. Plus, you know, they've done some work and they're prepared to have a conversation. Uh, almost never will someone turn you down when you make, take yeah. that approach. Those are smart, informed questions. Yeah. Kathy? I would just add two words that come to my mind, which might help people remember what you two just said. One is awareness, knowing what it is you need and are looking for. And the other is agency, the willingness to reach out and take action and take it and make something happen, whether it's asking a question or asserting a need that you might have. I love that. Thank you. And and there's another question that's that and I'm gonna take a first shot on this one just because I talk about it often. It's like, how do you find a mentor? So this is my little speech that I give. Um I and and this happened to me personally, but um, I'm always, I'm always careful to say, don't just go out and look for a mentor. I, um, the people that I tend to have space to mentor are people that are working with me or have volunteered to do something or are on a committee with me, or, um, I have some kind of relationship. And I remember early on when I was an early faculty member, I took some risks asking to be on some major committees and, and I was, but that gave me the space to kind of show my potential, take on assignments. And then people wanted to work with me. They, it was, it was more of a natural um, thing. Um, so that, that would be that, and that reciprocal, like, yes, I can get, I want to give time to, because I see that, 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 that person is, involved in helping me. So um, Kathy, let's start with you. Any, what other advice on either finding a mentor or a sponsor, I would say, say or any of the, any of the ones you've talked about? Yeah, I, you know, there's a very creative approach, which came to my mind years ago, listening to a student. <clears throat> and he said, he asked a very senior manager, if he would be willing to spend a half hour with him sharing how he got to where he is in his career. And um, the manager didn't know this person, but he said, sure, I'll, you know, we can get a coffee and I'll tell you what, what I know about how I got to where I am. And the guy had so much fun talking about himself oh. that at the end of the conversation, he said, well, let's get together again. The potential mentor said this. So it's simply asking a question that can engage the potential mentor sponsor in self-disclosure and self-reflection that can be very inviting to people and the beginning of a new relationship. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you so much. I would say you don't ever ask someone to be your mentor no, in general, right? right? Like <laughs> asking true. someone to get married on the first date. It's just, <laughs> don't do it. Um, because quite honestly, these relationships occur over time, just like any other relationship. And they're naturally forming if there's good rapport. And if you're making some effort in it, they are easier as Susan talked about, if you're doing a task together. So mm -hmm. if you're finding something that you're doing together, oftentimes there's there's it's easier to build rapport because there's a shared interest built in. 
Um, so that argues for joining um, different organizations where there's a shared interest that you can actually find something to connect over. Um, but it also points to the fact that doing a little bit of work on your side will go a long way <laughs> in helping facilitate a good conversation. And Wendy, let me let me throw this question to you. Um, what are your, I was going to say opinions, but what does the research and your opinion both say about the success of formal mentoring programs versus informal? We're talking, we've been talking more about informal. And sometimes you can, as an organization, you know, do some things where you could informally connect, right? But have you seen success with organizations with formal mentoring? I know I've read some literature and you have to be really, I'm looking at your face. So yeah, no, you know what? Formal mentoring programs do work. 90% of Fortune 500 companies now have some sort of mentoring programs. And they have really to be designed help. well, though, don't, don't they? Well, they really help with recruiting and retention more than anything. Yes. Okay. Um, and so what, what we say is the, the research does show that there's there's that R squared goes up. So the, the end results, whether you're looking at career satisfaction, retention, learning, um, people getting promoted, moving on in their career, all of those results are there. They're just not as strong as they are with informal mentoring. Mm -hmm. and they're even better if you look at the, the network, the developmental network. Um, and so what we're arguing is you know, Kathy and I, when you have the opportunity to be in a formal mentoring program, great, do mm -hmm. it. Use the opportunity to learn how to be a great mentee or protege, learn how to be a great mentor, and then go out and use those skills informally to build your own personal board of advisors and help your people as a leader, help your people develop those skills and in fact, start to connect them to potential other developers. I mean, the thing that none of us should forget is that sometimes those potential developers are what we'd call step ahead peer mentors. People who are barely ahead of you in your career are often the most effective because they're closest to the skill sets you need directly to get to that next place. Rather than looking way up in the organization, look to the next person, the person you can emulate most clearly. And, and I would say sometimes especially in academics, sometimes you can do, a, you know, peers, but they have different experiences. So they may have different advice or whatever you might need in certain areas. So it's not all clear and cut, it seems like. Kathy, I'm going to give you a hard question. You've been at this for a while. Um, uh, this came from one of the, the folks listening in. Um, how about if we are in a relationship that is toxic or unproductive? <clears throat> and I'm so how can, well, yeah. I love the, the tone of this because the tone is, well, I was thinking, how do we get out? But the tone here is how do we shift that into more of a positive relationship? Right. Well, um, it's such <laughs> a critical question and there's not an easy answer, yeah. but I think the beginning is to acknowledge the reality that something's not right here. And I often suggest that people actually explore what they are experiencing in the toxic relationship with another trusted person, uh -huh. whether it's a peer, or another mentor or a family member Partner. just to gain yeah. clarity what is it about this relationship that's not working for me and based on that you might decide uh, and i've witnessed this I, and i think i've probably experienced it once or twice in my life decide that that person just is not in this relationship for healthy reasons they're trying to control me. They're trying to prevent me from moving on. They're undermining my development. And it's just time to let it go and move on. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah. Another possibility is, well, I haven't really been very clear about what I need at this stage of my development. And so I'm going to take a crack at reviewing that with my developer 
and tell them, you know, I'm a little different now than I was when we first met. And I'm looking for more autonomy, but I still value your guidance. Is there a way we can modify how mm -hmm. we work together? So mm -hmm. you know, there's a kind of a continuum from excellent to destructive. And you have to first figure out where are you on that continuum? And is there room to improve? Yeah. Um, it's not black or white. It's not yes or no usually. Um, but if consistently you have negative feelings when you're with this person or you feel smothered or undermined, it's probably a pretty good indicator it's time to move on. What I, I appreciate what, uh, yeah. what I appreciate your about your response is is ha having not going deep into the emotional response, but saying, hey, I'm in a different place. You know, having that, don't shy away from that, but but have it in in really more of a logical space. And then one other thing I just want to clarify um, with you, you know, oftentimes to have it really be a good developmental relationship, you said maybe go to a trusted friend. I'm not sure. Sometimes we just have to unload and complain a little bit, right? But um but the kind of relationship I felt like you were talking about was more of a talking through it, you know, getting some good advice. Is that, Wendy, you're nodding? Any yeah. other comments yeah. about that? I mean, specifically, that that is something a learning partner could do or a peer mentor can do. I mean, uh, when Kathy's talking about those relationships, those are ones that are more available to you, more likely to be able to have the time to talk with you about another party. In formal programs, we talk about the importance of having a coordinator or a director, some third party that's sort of that's neutral and can help you work through problematic occurrences with the relationship. Super important for a formal program to have that person in place. And so you're looking for it informally. You're looking for who's my person that I can talk through this other relationship with. You. And in your writing, you also, just to go a little bit further and clarify something, you talk about the differences between high quality and low quality. Um, and so we could map out, you know, who are our mentors, who are this and that, but, but thinking about the quality, what does that entail? Which one of you would like to jump in uh, first on that one? Well, I can start. When do you pick up? the back end. <laughs> so we're talking first and foremost about rapport and trust between two people. And how do we achieve that? It's through self-disclosure and active listening. And what do we achieve? We achieve mutuality, that is both people feeling involved and reciprocity both people feeling as if they're learning something important in the relationship. Those are all characteristics of high quality relationships. Um, there are many more, but I would say those are the fundamentals. What would you add, Wendy? Yeah. No, I mean, when you go to the, the other extreme, it tends to just be absence of those qualities yeah. um, more than anything in particular. And we we love to label those as tormentors. Like they're not really, really looking out for our best interests. Mm -hmm. They might be self-interested. Um, I think one of the things that Kathy mentioned was really important is your degree of self-disclosure. And we're not asking you to disclose your deepest, darkest secrets, but mm -hmm. just making it clear to people the help that you need when you ask for help, you know, the strongest principal underlying relationships is reciprocity and people are likely to respond when they're asked for help. Um, so maybe sh shifting as much as you can towards that dynamic. And, and Kathy, in your response, it seems like, I'm gonna pull in a, another question from, from the people that are participating today, but it seems like some of your last responses would also apply to how to be, how do we prepare ourselves to be a mentor. And, and I do want to say as well that we can mentor when we're still in high school. We can mentor, you know, there's ways to mentor all the way around. Any 
Any comments, Kathy? I would absolutely agree with you that the same relational skills that I just mentioned in terms of self-disclosure and active listening and building rapport, those are also necessary for being a mentor. Um, they're really just, they're the same. It's about respect and, and uh, presence to a person and a new relationship and being responsive to what the other person presents. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have this schedule to, for another like uh, 14 minutes, but I may wrap it up a little bit to help Wendy get on the road. Um, but let me ask you <laughs> for with those soccer cleats. I know, I know that I have had four kids that played soccer and many other sports. And so I could tell by your face when you, you said, um, I got to take this that, you know, <laughs> that it was probably one of your kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and sometimes we just have to do that. And I think COVID has helped us a little bit more be have some empathy um, with with you know other people as well. Uh, women typically have empathy <laughs> with other women a little bit more. But I would love to have. I mean, what? So we talked about this already. Um, but but any other advice on how women can find and develop those relationships? I think Kathy, you address that quite a bit. So maybe maybe you feel like we've addressed that already. Anything I, else you want to put? I'd like to make a summary comment about that. Mm -hmm. I think if we've succeeded in getting our message across today, I would hope that everybody would go be more sensitized to considering every relationship as a possibility mm -hmm. to provide developmental opportunities our spouses, our children, our subordinates, our bosses, our peers, you know, and to, just to be aware that it's really up to us to be self-aware about what it is we're seeking and then thoughtful about who I might pursue a particular interest or need with. Um, and you'll have plenty of opportunities ahead of you. That's my, I don't know if it's naive, but it's where I've come after no, I like years. I like it because yeah. as, as you both know, the, the research that I dig into too, we're all in the same literature, that we can um, in those moments learn from anything. And it's in the key, as Wendy said earlier, is the reflection. I mean, I love a quote, I don't have it memorized that it's, it's not in the experiences we have, it's in the reflecting on the experiences that we actually learn. So it's up to us. And I love what you said about, we can learn from our kids. Oh my gosh, have I learned a lot from my kids. <laughs> right, right. Try to shut out yeah. some of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, hard things are good learning too, right? So so my last question for you, and I've, I've been working in questions from the audience too, so just know if you're listening and still that, that I have worked in most of the questions, but I want to wrap us up here by asking, now what advice would you have for company leaders or organizational leaders? Because we know workplaces are in government and for-profit and, and schools and universities like we work in. But what advice would you give company leaders or organizational leaders to create environments where more women can really thrive and advance? Um, or environments where these relationships, you know, there's more relate of these kinds of relationships. Kathy, I'll have you start on that one and then finish up with Wendy. Well, you know, companies and organizations really vary in the extent to which they value development. So the first thing company leaders would need to consider is do our HR practices really support a developmental culture? That is a, a workplace that encourages learning, making mistakes, learning from mistakes, improving one's performance. That's the beginning. What kind of culture do we have and how do our practices support a learning developmental 
culture. The next piece, I really do think um, organizations can create opportunities for informal interactions like ERG groups um, and other uh, women leaders groups and task forces that bring together, um, if we're concerned about women's development, making sure they have access to other women who might serve these various developer roles, but more generally for everybody. Um, and I do like the idea of formal programs when they are introduced as one way to foster mentorship, not the only way, um, but one way that can be useful and complemented with informal opportunities as well. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, I want to validate everything Kathy just said and extend it with leaders are critical role models in their organizations. Um, so if leaders can talk freely about mistakes they've made and what they've learned and create the opportunities for others in dialogue to have those conversations, that's a really important part of what a leader can do to facilitate others' comfort with having those conversations. Um, as a leader, understanding this research about developmental networks and having those developmental conversations with people that report to you and encouraging them to also develop others in the same way, that's sort of a network approach. Um, so when you have a formal program, having a part of that program teach about developmental networks and teach about how to extend that learning beyond the formal program. Um, all of those are sort of entry points into, as a leader, having a direct impact on the, that sort of behavior. Um, from a cultural standpoint, right, having everyone uh, on board and, and talking about how they're going to facilitate learning because professional development now is learning and it really is on the individual. We're not telling mm -hmm. anyone exactly what their next steps are. And so providing people with the support to do so. I, I appreciate both of your comments. I think one last thing I would say back to um, when I speak a lot, I talk about, and I mentioned this before, I said, is that a relationship or a developmental relationship? Is this an experience or can you shift even within yourself so it's a developmental experience? Mm -hmm. And also oftentimes ERGs have um, just networking events. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if we're gonna net have networking, that's great and social networking has its place. However, let's ask ourselves each time, do we have an activity or do, or do we have a developmental? Like what can we add or change slightly to really help people get that developmental I like that. lens yeah. on everything? So I, I think that's so important. Thanks so much to yeah. both of you for joining us today. And also yeah. I'd like to thank our sponsors again, the Utah Education Network, the John M. Huntsman School of Business, and USU Extension for making this event possible. So thanks again to the speakers and thanks to all of you for Thank joining. You. Thank thanks. you, Susan. Yeah.